Ryland, guys. Today we finish up our series called Discovering Joy. We've been moving through the book of Philippians verse by verse. If you've missed any of these, I'd encourage you to listen on our website, rockbrook.org, or pick up a CD and you can listen in the car on the way to work, however you want to do it. But you can fill in the gaps. Uh, Today we're going to look at the last few verses of this incredible book of Philippians. And Paul ends this book with what I think is one of the greatest promises in the Bible. Uh, It's Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Let's read this out loud together. You can be sure that God will take care of everything you need, His generosity exceeding yours in the glory that pours from Jesus. You can be sure that God will take care of everything you need. Uh, You know, this is not a hope, it's not a wish, it's not a, boy, I'd really like it if this would happen. Uh, Paul says, you can be sure. It's a promise, it's a certainty. God guarantees that he'll take care of everything that you need. On your outline, circle that word, everything. Uh, In the Greek, that's the word pos. Pos means anything, everything, all things, whatever, whenever, however, every circumstances at all times. Uh, The only thing included, not included, in that definition is nothing. It's everything. Emotional needs, yes. Physical needs, yes. Financial needs, relational needs, spiritual needs, yes. God says, I'll take care of every need in your life. So my big question as I look at this verse is, is then why do you and I have so many unmet needs? Is God a liar? Is this just a verse that I kind of hope this works? Or is God saying that he will really, truly meet every need? If so, then why aren't all our needs met? Well, I've told you many times that with every promise in Scripture, there's a premise. With every promise, there's a condition. Over 7,000 promises in the Bible, and every one of them, God says, if you do this, then this is what will happen. If you do this, then God will do this. Every promise has a premise. It has a condition. And I can't claim Philippians 4.19 unless I do what it says in verses 14 through 18. That's the premise of the promise. And in that passage of Scripture, God promises to meet your needs, and that promise is tied directly to your generosity. God says, I will exceed your generosity. I remember the whole reason that Paul wrote this book. The Philippians is a thank you note to the Philippian church for an offering that they sent to Paul. Now, this is a thank you note for financial support, a financial gift that they uh, had taken and sent to Paul. Paul's in prison. He's awaiting execution for preaching the gospel. He'd started churches all over the Roman Empire. Paul had started churches in Corinth, in Galatia, which is a region. He'd started in the city of Ephesus, the city of Philippi, the city of Colossae, and he wrote letters to those churches. And those letters make up most of the New Testament. And Paul writes these letters, and he says, you guys in Philippi have been the most generous of of everybody. And this book is a thank you note to you. It's a receipt for their gift. And Paul commends, he commends the Philippians to all the other churches. In fact, in his letter to Corinthians, he uh, commends the Philippians. In 2 Corinthians 8, Paul says, I want you to know about the church at Philippi's generosity. Even while suffering in severe trials and extreme poverty, their lives have overflowed with joy. Again, the theme of Philippians is joy. Extreme poverty, severe trials, their lives overflowed with joy. Why? because of their amazing generosity. Paul says, I personally witnessed they're not simply giving what they could afford, but giving even beyond their human ability. I mean, these people were flat broke. They were experiencing severe trial and adverse conditions and extreme poverty, and yet they're giving beyond their human ability. He says, no one told them to do it. It was due to their own generous hearts. In fact, they begged and pleaded for the privilege of giving to serve God's people. And they gave in a way we did not expect. They first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us. That is what pleases God. And so Paul, to the Corinthian church, commends the Philippians 
for their generosity. It says the Philippians gave like nobody else. One of the primary ways that you discover joy in your life is through giving generously. One of the primary ways. It's no accident that the word miser and miserable have the same root. Because misers are miserable. The more miserly I am, the more miserable I am. The more generous I am, the more joyful I am. And so Paul ends Philippians by saying, if you want to truly discover joy, you have to learn to be generous. And in the book of Philippians, he lists six benefits of being a generous person. Six benefits of generosity. We're just going to march through them tonight as we close out this this book. First benefit of generosity is, number one, I earn the gratitude of others. When I am generous, I earn the gratitude of other people. I mean, just think about yourself. Think about the people in your life that you're the most grateful for. Who are they? They're the people who have invested in you. They're the people who have invested time and money money and energy and patience and skill. The people you are most grateful for are the people who have given the most to you. If they were stingy, you're not grateful for them. What's there to be grateful for? Nobody's grateful for a person's stinginess. We're grateful for a person's generosity. And Paul gives an example of the most giving people, of being the most appreciated people, when he says this of the Philippians. He says, how grateful I am and how I praise the Lord that you are helping me again. It was so good that you helped me when I needed it. You Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I brought you the good news of Jesus Christ. No other church did this. You sent me aid again and again when I was in need, so I am generously supplied with the gifts that you sent me. Paul says, I'm grateful for their generosity. Philippians 1, he says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to God because you have been my partners in spreading the good news of Christ. It is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a very special place in my heart. We have shared together the blessing of God. So here's the question. Is anybody grateful for your generosity? I mean, can you think of 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 people who are thankful for the generosity that you have shown to them? They would say, that person has been so generous with me. Because the first benefit of being generous is I earn the gratitude of other people. And folks, that is not a bad thing. That is not a selfish thing. I mean, when you think of the people that you're grateful for, is that a bad thing? I mean, do you have bad thoughts when you're grateful for all they've poured into your life? No. Gratitude is a good thing. It's not like they did something wrong because they poured into you. It's not wrong for you to appreciate their generosity. Being grateful is a good thing, and being grateful is brought about by generosity. Second benefit. Every time I'm generous, I show what really matters most. Why? Why? Because what matters the most? Is it things or people? Things don't matter most. Life is not about the acquisition of things. And so when you're generous with your things, with your time, with your money, with your energy, every time you give, you're showing what matters to you. And I've told you before, show me your money or your checkbook. Show me where your money goes and I'll tell you where your heart is. I'll tell you what really matters. I don't care what you say matters the most. But you pull out your checkbook and your calendar and it will tell you what really matters the most. Jesus said, wherever your money is, that's where your heart's going to be. Uh, you know, I, I, have, uh, I don't care about Microsoft because I don't own any Microsoft stock. So I don't care what Microsoft does. Uh, but if I had stock in Microsoft, I would be interested in Microsoft and what they do. I'd care about the success of that company because wherever you put your money, that's where you put your heart. Your giving shows what really matters most. And Paul talks about this issue through the whole book of Philippians, what matters most. Look at Philippians 1.10. He says, I want you to understand what really matters. (laughs) So I want you to understand what really matters. And the way I give shows what really matters in my life. Jesus said, a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things he possesses. Life is not about things. It's about learning how to love. It's about relationships. 
And if at the end of life I've got a big pile of things, but I'm estranged from my wife and my kids and I don't have any friends or co-workers in the ministry, I've missed the whole purpose of life. Because the purpose of life is not the acquisition of things. It's influencing people and helping them to fulfill the purposes of God in their life for the glory of God. That's the purpose. You're to use things and love people. And you get that turned around. You start loving things. You'll use people. And you'll miss the purpose of life. You'll be living life backwards. And so Paul says, every time I'm generous, I'm generous with my time, with my money, with my energy, I'm, I'm demonstrating what matters most. What matters most is God and people. Philippians 3.7, he says, all the things I once thought were so very important, I now consider worthless because of Christ. And that's how generosity breaks the grip of materialism on my life. Materialism is the idea that having more will make me happy, that having more will make me more secure, that having more will make me more valuable, more important. None of those things are true. Materialism is all about getting, get, get, get. How do you break the grip of materialism on your life? Only one way. Give, give, give. Every time I'm generous, I break the grip of materialism on my life. Philippians 3.20, Paul says, We're citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. He says, I'm not living for here and now. I'm living for eternity. I'm living for my life in heaven because that's where my citizenship is. So what does my generosity, what does my giving reveal about me? What does it reveal uh, is most important in my life? You know, where I put my money is where I put my heart. And so one of the benefits of being generous is it demonstrates that I know what's most important. Breaks the grip of materialism. Third benefit of being generous, number three. I become more like Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the most generous person who ever lived. Giving is the essence of God. God is a giver. If God was not a giver, we wouldn't be here right now. God wasn't a giver. Everything in life, including life itself, is a gift from God. The air we breathe, the sun that shines down on us, a beating heart, breathing lungs. I didn't earn these lungs. I didn't earn this life. It's a gift. It's a gift from a generous God. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Heavenly Father. Now you might say, hey, wait a minute, I work hard to earn my money. Well, where do you think you got the ability to work hard? Where do you think you got the opportunity to work hard? Yeah, but I thought this up. Where do you think you got your brain? It's all a gift that has been granted to you by the grace of God. Everything. Because God is generous. And God wants his children to become like him. So every time you're generous, a change takes place in you. Every time you give, your heart moves a tweak closer to Christ-likeness. You become more like Jesus every time you give. Philippians 1.11 says, Your lives will be filled with the truly good qualities which only Jesus Christ can produce for the glory and praise of God. Now this is extremely counterculture because everything in our culture says to get, not give. And we live in an increasingly self-centered culture where it's all about me, me, myself, and I, my stuff, my needs, my wants. And so when I'm generous, I stop thinking about me and I start thinking about other people, Philippians 2, 4, and 5. Don't just look at your own, out for your own interests, but look also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ gave his life for us. We ought to give our life for Christ. We ought to give our life for one another. It'll make us like Christ. Fourth benefit of generosity. Every time I'm generous, I strengthen my faith. Why does being generous, why does giving increase my faith? Well, what's the number one reason why people don't give? Because they're afraid if they give it away, they won't have any left. They won't have enough. And people say, I can't afford to tithe. I can't afford to give. Because if I do, I won't have enough to meet my needs. I'm afraid to give for fear I'll run out. If I give my money to God, I'll be broke. I won't be able to make it. 
and that's driven by fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. So when I give, it increases my faith. I have to depend on God to help me. You know, I've only got a certain amount of time to get my stuff done. If I stop doing my stuff and start doing God's stuff, if I start giving my time away in rock brick for kids or in our youth ministry or uh, with the setup crew or cleaning crew or hosting a small group, now I've got to trust God to help me with the time I've got left to get done the stuff I need to get done. It increases my faith in regards to my time. If I invest my energy in ministry, that's a statement of faith that I'm going to depend on God. I've only got so much energy. And I'm trusting God to give me the strength through Jesus Christ to do all I need to do. Every time I give, my faith grows stronger. Faith is like a muscle. It, sh- it grows the more you use it. So Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray and ask God for everything you need, always giving thanks. In other words, increase your faith. Don't worry. Pray. Trust God. Increase your faith. Thank God for the fact that he promises to meet your needs. And each time I do that, and each time I'm generous, my faith gets stronger and stronger. Fifth benefit of generosity. Every time I'm generous, I invest in my eternal home. Every time I'm generous, I am investing in in my eternal home. Jesus called this storing up treasure in heaven. He says, store up for yourself treasure in heaven. See, when you give, you are storing up for yourself. You're not storing up for God. God, uh, Truthfully, God's already got it all. Jesus himself says, you are storing up for yourself treasure in heaven. That's just another way that God is generous. You get to store up for you. God doesn't need your gifts. He's the one who gave them to you. You know, God doesn't need your money to build the church. God doesn't need your money to spread the gospel in North India. God doesn't need your money to build those houses in Taklaban. God can do all of those things without you. He can do all of those things without you. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need your money. But it is a generous gift of God to invite you into the process. Because when you participate in the process, when you give, when you go, when you pray, when you participate, you reap the benefit. You reap the benefit. God lets you give so you can get the reward. You get the increase in the investment. You know how many times Jesus used the phrase, store up for yourselves treasure in heaven? Six times. Six times. I mean, anytime Jesus says something six times, he means it. It's important. You need to pay attention because if you don't, you're going to miss out on the blessing. You're going to miss out on the benefit. Because life's not about storing up things here on earth. Life is about storing up things in heaven. Jesus says, you store it up down here. Thieves can steal it. Rust can rust it. Moths can eat it. So you want to store it up someplace where it can't be taken away from you. Everything you store up here is only temporary. Everything you store in heaven, you're going to enjoy for trillions and trillions of years. So it obviously makes sense. I would invest more there than here. Because anything I've got here, I'm leaving here when I go. You never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You do not get to take it with you. One of my favorite Gilligan's Islands episodes, yes, I watch Gilligan's Island, <laughs> is they, they're afraid that, that the island is sinking. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Howell are fretting about all their money and what's going to happen. And they're just fretting and struggling. And Thurston stops and he says, Lovey, one more time, can't we figure out a way to take it with us? And the answer is, no, you can't, Thurston. That's why you need to be more like Jed Clampett. (laughs) That's my economic theory. You can be like Thurston Howell, you can be like Jed Clampett. I'm going with Jed. Jesus says you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead by investing in people who are going there, by investing it in the church. Jesus says, whenever you give, it's not an expense, it's not a loss, it's not something you're giving up, it's an eternal investment. 
And Jesus says, you'll be paid back. You'll be paid back a hundredfold. You'll be paid back a thousandfold. You give your time away in ministry, you're going to be rewarded in heaven. You give your energy away in ministry, you're going to be rewarded in heaven. You give your money away, you're going to be rewarded in heaven. Philippians 4.17, Paul says, Though I appreciate your gifts, what makes me happiest is the well-earned reward. Circle that, the well-earned reward you will receive because of your generosity. Paul says, you're storing up treasure in heaven. American Bi New American Bible says, I want you to have the profit that accrues to your own account. You know, are you investing in your retirement account? Not your individual retirement account, but your eternal retirement account. I mean, have you sent anything on ahead? Or is it just all being spent here? Contemporary English version says, I want you to receive the blessings that come from giving. You're building your eternal home when you're generous. First Timothy 6, give happily to those in need and always be ready to share whatever God has given you. By doing this, you will be storing up real treasure for yourselves in heaven. It is the only safe investment for eternity. Fifth benefit to generosity, you're storing up in heaven. Sixth benefit, every time I'm generous, I make God smile. Every time you're generous, you make God happy. Generous giving is an act of worship that brings joy to the heart of God. Philippians 4.18, your gifts are like a fragrant offering to God, a sacrifice that God accepts and is pleasing to Him. Every time you give, you make God smile. Every time you give, you make God happy. I mean, parents, you get this. Are you happy when your kids are selfish? No, no. Are you happy when your kids learn to share? Yes. You know, you're happy when our kids are generous. Of course we are. God loves it when his kids are generous because it means they're just like him. And God is watching you every day of your life to see what do you do with what you've been given. Are you ready to share it with other people? You know, these six things are the premise behind the greatest promise in the Bible. God says when you're generous, like the Philippians... When you give, you earn gratitude. When you give, you become more like Jesus. When you give, you stretch your faith. When you give, you invest in heaven. When you give, you show what matters. When you give, you please God. That's the premise. Then God gives the promise in Philippians 4.19. Let's read this. Then God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Then God will will meet your needs. God says, you're never going to outgive me. You're never going to outgive me. You cannot outgive God. But you've got to remember the premise to the promise. Because God says, I'm watching to see if you're generous. Now, there are two ways you can give. You can give by reason or by revelation. You can be generous by reason or generous by revelation. And one of them gets God's blessing and the other one doesn't. Because one of them requires faith and the other one doesn't. Jesus says, according to your faith, it will be done to you. So you want to do the one that requires faith. And that's by revelation. Now, there's two ways to give. And in this instance, we can take the example. Let's take the example of the Philippines. Not the Philippians, but the Philippines. You know, the Philippines had that typhoon Yolanda that hit last year. Terrible tragedy, killed thousands of people, wiped out the city of Taklaban. And we've had the opportunity to help those people. And we have another opportunity to help those people rebuild their houses, rebuild their neighborhoods. And there are two ways that I can figure out how to help those people. One way is by reason. I can ask, what is a reasonable amount that I can give to this project? And so I look at my checkbook, I look at my resources, and I figure out what have I got, what can I afford to give away, and I can give a reasonable amount about it. I don't have to pray about it, I don't have to trust God for it, it's just right there, it's reasonable, I can afford to give it. That's the way most people give. You know, people ask, what can I afford to give? And then they write out a check for a reasonable amount, and they give on the basis of reason. There's another way to give, and that's by revelation. And this makes generosity an adventure of faith. It's like the Philippians. It says they gave more than they were able to give. How do you do that? 
How do you give more than you are able to give? Well, you give by revelation instead of by reason. You know, if you looked at, at what reason said that the Philippians could afford to give, and if you looked at what they sacrificially gave, they didn't add up. It didn't make sense. I mean, how could they give that much? Because God gave through them. Instead of saying, what can I afford to give? You ask, Lord, what do you want to give through me? Lord, what do you want to give through me? And you ask God to reveal, to give you a revelation of an amount that God wants you to give. It's not math. It's through meditation. It's through connection with God. It's way beyond reason. God always gives you an amount that's too big. Because that's the amount that stretches your faith. That's the amount that causes you to trust Him. That's the amount that gives Him glory. And God meets the needs of people. Money doesn't just fall out of the sky to meet those needs. When God meets the needs of people, He uses other people. When God meets your needs, the gifts He gives to you, they come through other people. When God meets the needs of other people, He does it through you. Why does He do it that way? God does it that way because God is generous. God does it that way so you and I can reap these six benefits of being generous. If God didn't use us to meet the needs of other people, we would miss out on the benefits. And so God asks you, are you going to give by reason or are you going to give by revelation? Will you earn the gratitude of other people? Will you show what truly matters most to you? Will you become more like Jesus? Will you strengthen your faith? Will you invest in eternal rewards? Will you make God smile? Reason says, I can't afford it. Revelation says, God wants to use you in an amazing way to do amazing things. But you've got to open your heart, open your life to the generous offer of God. We have to live in such a way that we can reap these six benefits of generosity. You know, the theme of this series has been discovering joy. We've been looking at at how to be happy. How do we do this? How do we bring joy into our lives? I want to end this series with the words of Jesus Christ himself. Remember the words that Jesus himself said, there is more happiness in giving than in receiving. God invites you to partake in the joy of being generous. Let's pray together. Just pray with me in the quietness of your heart. Just say, Lord, I just thank you for all the things that you have given me. I thank you that you made me, you gifted me, you saved me. I thank you that I live in America, that you you placed me in a place that is free, that I am healthy, I am prosperous. I mean, compared to the rest of the world, Lord, we're just rich. God, I thank you for the joy of having a purpose in life. Life is not about me, it's all about you. And I thank you that you invite me into the process of building your church and reaching the world for Jesus Christ. God, I thank you as as I give and go and pray that, that, that you promise to provide for my needs here and now. You promise to reward me in heaven forever. What a great and generous God you are. So, Lord, help me to become more and more and more like you, to give not just what I can afford by reason, but to give more than I'm able by revelation. God, open my eyes to see the adventure of generosity that is before me, to grow in my faith, to become more like Christ, to claim the promise of these six benefits. If you're here tonight and you've never invited Jesus Christ into your heart, the first thing you need to do is give your your life to Christ. It says the Philippians gave themselves first to the Lord. It starts with just a simple, heartfelt prayer. Christ, thank you for all you've given me. I now give you my life. I want my life to be in the center of your plan. I want to live for the purpose that you made me for. And I want to trust you and follow you and learn to love you. And so tonight, I give myself to you as a gift. God, I pray that you would make me generous, that I would be a gift-giving person just as you are a gift-giving God. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.